So the first presentation is held by uh, Piotr, Maria Pina, and uh, Ufuk um, towards understanding and quantifying the value of SHM and inspection data for seismic um, risk management of buildings. So please go ahead. All right, good morning, everybody. The title was already, and the offers were already mentioned, so I will just go very quickly to the next slide because uh, we don't have much time. The outline of the presentation is that uh, in introduction, there will be a little bit uh, information about of two types of uh, seismic structural health monitoring that we propose or envisage. Uh, then the value of information for seismic building monitoring will be cast as a pre-posterior risk-based decision-making uh, problem, and a framework for that will be shown. Um, uh, elements of the of the f does that uh, the pre-posterior framework will be discussed uh, in terms by, by my co-authors, uh, first damage detection techniques in the probabilistic framework, then utilizing both inspection and monitoring data for the purpose of what we want to achieve, and at the end, some information, if time allows, uh, about modeling of consequences and uh, cost for seismic risk uh, assessment, and finally, I will try to wrap up with a set of conclusions. Uh, so first, uh, two types of seismic structural health monitoring, and to start with... Uh, it's not yet two types, uh, which is the title of that part, but uh, types of seismic monitoring arrays we can, um, we can have in that situation. Now, typically when, when, when we hear uh, structural health monitoring, we think about putting sensors on the structure, right? So they are shown here on the building. Uh, well, on foundations too. That's very important in the seismic context because obviously the um, forcing uh, to the building is through the foundations, right, through ground motions. But that's, that's not a, uh, all that we can think in terms of instrumenting the whole system and it always occurs uh, there is some monitoring of uh, nearby faults which originate, where, where the um, excitation to the structure originates, as well as there will be typically sensors uh, in the wider area, perhaps whole city, perhaps even whole region and so on. And this is all useful uh, to measure attenuation characteristics, hazard exposure and so on. Uh, if you think about it, uh, in seismic uh, monitoring, uh, there is variable sensors on the building and then obviously sensors there, but it's not really only the, the, the presence of sensors far away from the building is not only restricted to, uh, to seismic monitoring situation. You can envisage, for example, a transportation network of a city equipped with uh, several weight in motion uh, measurement stations, which allow you to, to, to characterize better uh, properties of the loading and so on. But um, acting on a given bridge or perhaps a collection of bridges or similar situations. So this is just to emphasize that there is more um, sources of information that we normally typically assume exist. Uh, two types of uh, uh, now uh, seismic SHM. Uh, or perhaps uses of, uh, of data from such uh, monitoring exercises. First one would be use for quick post-event actual damage detection. I think Helmut was saying yesterday that uh, it focuses on performance. It's true for systems which deteriorate slowly due to, say, for example, fatigue, corrosion, and so on. I, for seismic, I would say that we are still interested in damage, which will occur suddenly without much accumulation uh, over time as such. Uh, basically, uh, th this type of monitoring, this type of system will be, depending on the output from them, decision will be to either evacuate the building after a strong motion event, or quickly resume normal uninterrupted building usage, right? The two different scenarios which you can see, if you get your decisions evacuate or not evacuate wrong, the consequences are, are uh, as follows. If you evacuate when there is actually no damage, right, so we are here, uh, that entails uh, unnecessary losses to business interruption, rent income, cost of alternative accommodation, and so on, where you don't really have to do that. On the other hand, a wrong decision when you do not evacuate, when there has actually been damage sustained by the building, it means that Typically, after the main shock, you will have a series of aftershocks. The building will be weakened already by the main shocks. And therefore, if people are still in the building, equipment or whatever content is there, uh, they may die right, because of you allowing them to uh, stay there. Uh, second type of monitoring, uh, 
It's uh, not related to damage detection as such. It is based on collection of data for updating hazard and vulnerability models. So this is typically modeling, modeling of those uh, faults and so on and wider areas where well, you, 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 you measure fault activity, you measure wave propagation, typically over extended period of time to capture larger numbers of seismic events, and you can update probabilistic hazard models in this case. Uh, there is also a place for sensors on the building where you will be able to calibrate um, your, for example, uh, computer models of the building or generally speaking your vulnerability models related to a given, model, given uh, building. Downside is that those will be very likely many events, so statistically you can process them, but they will be low, moderate intensity and so on. So not really, well, there will be problem of extending this type of data to strong uh, event. So uh, we started to thinking about how to cast this uh, decision making about whether you use monitoring or not as a pre-posterior risk-based decision making problem. Uh, yesterday there was more than one presentation about the theory behind those uh, type of um, uh, decision-making processes, so I won't go through it. And what we did, it's a, it's a well-known technique. We just applied it to a particular problem, so I will talk about what is relevant, what is different in, well, what is specific about it uh, compared to general theory. So you start with basically the decision uh, either to monitor, do not monitor or do nothing, that doesn't cost anything, right? or monitor, there will immediately be some cost. This is a very simplified decision tree with only two branches at each node. In practice, you will have uh, much more decisions here. Well, monitoring, it could be several options, several techniques with associated costs and so on. There is place also for, for example, things like uh, enhanced, <coughs> enhanced uh, visual inspection, something along the lines of BORP program in, in, in San Francisco area, building operation, resumption, building operation resumption program, where you effectively pay consultancy so that in case of uh, your building potentially being damaged, they quickly send people for, uh, for um, visual inspections. Uh, other options to manage risks, and this was already covered in some presentations yesterday, is for example to strengthen structure. And again, a number of options are possible. Combinations of those options, monitoring plus some strengthening, using visual inspections and monitoring, indeed Ufuk will be talking soon about uh, how to merge those types of data, are also possible. Right? Then, once you decide to monitor, your system will either detect damage with certain probability, sorry, not detect damage, zero is uh, for DD damage detection, zero means negative outcome, or it will detect damage, right? So this is DD, uh, DD1. Uh, well, you know, in, in perfect word, uh, damage detection means either false, sorry, true positive or false positive, right? Based on the indication from system, you will be making decisions either to evac not evacuate building or evacuate building. Again, this is a very simplified uh, situation. There may be other decisions to be made at that point. For example, whether you want to quickly, reasonably quickly, of course, because it's not a question of minutes or anything like that, uh, repair the building or perhaps, I don't know, demolish it even and so on. Uh, the real state of nature, so this is DS, zero or one, the S for, from damage actually sustained, S for sustained is here. Each of those situations, decisions and chance outcomes entail certain costs or consequences, generally speaking, or costs, right? As I said, if you evacuate building, there will be business interruption. If you do not evacuate, but the building later collapses, there will be cost of, uh, or consequences will be lives lost in that situation. Uh, now, I realized while reading around the topic that uh, some nearly 10 years ago there was a uh, cost action on building robustness and several people on this, in this room were part of it. So uh, I here assumed that damage means failure immediately, right? So you can think about it that I'm, I'm not, I'm considering the situation that the building is not robust. If you want it, you can end here another chance event from damage to, to failure to account for robustness. Uh, I will skip that probably slide because of lack of time, but uh, Dimitri was explaining how to analyze those types of trees. You go back and uh, at each, well, 
chance event, you calculate expected uh, cost. So this is, will be probability uh, times consequences or times cost, effectively risk. Right? And uh, at each point, um, at each decision node, you try to minimize risk. Now, we talk about here, uh, as the formula here, right, which is lengthy and perhaps not immediately obvious if, uh, but the, the basic idea is to choose the path, right, from here or from here and so on, which will result in least cost, including cost of monitoring and minimizing at the same time uh, the risk. Right? So, and that finally, finally uh, answers the question whether you are on this part of the tree or this part of the tree, based on risk. Um, yes, and with that, I will pass on to Maria. Detection, which can be expressed in terms of uh, uh, the likelihood function of a, a chosen damage feature, which could be a model parameter, for example, uh, the frequency, the period, or other, and in terms of the uh, prior probabilities. The prior <coughs> probabilities uh, can be calculated as, uh, estimated better, uh, f um, as uh, um, we will see from the fragility curves. Uh, here are the, the usual likelihood function, that is the probability <coughs> that uh, uh, damage is, is not detected given damage exists uh, or the probability of damage uh, being detected given damage exists. And the same here, uh, damage <coughs> not being detected given damage uh, do not, ex do not uh, exist and uh, the probability of damage <coughs> being detected when it does not exist. The fragility curves, uh, uh, these are plots of the conditional probabilities of exceed, exceeding a given uh, damage state at various levels of uh, the ground motion. Uh, this depends uh, from the hazard of the um, seismic uh, zones. So our plot, uh, the fragility curves are plot like this, where <coughs> there is a parameter which expresses the, uh, the level of ground motion, which could be the peak ground acceleration or, the, or uh, spectral acceleration, for example. And then on the vertical axis, there is the um, conditional probability of exceeding a given damage level, a damage state. Uh, here are represented uh, several, four different uh, damage states from collapse to minor, uh, uh, minor damage. Um, this plot can usually are uh, defined in terms of a damage parameter, which, is, which could be, for example, the interstory drift or uh, the number of buildings collapsed uh, with respect to the total number of buildings of, of that uh, type. And this parameter need not to be the same uh, damage feature which is used to, um, for which the likelihood functions are, um, are calculated. Uh, the likelihood function, um, of course, when uh, we are in the realm of the pre-posterior analysis. There is not a monitoring system on the structure. And so these functions cannot be estimated based on the data recorded on the structure. They have to be estimated using numerical models or uh, using a statistical model. And this, this is my opinion, is the really weak point uh, of uh, all the procedure because uh, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty in this. But uh, I would uh, love to to hear the, the, what, what is the idea of uh, people who are more involved than me in the estimation of likelihood function on this. Uh, okay, uh, this is the, 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 the face of uh, likelihood, what could be the likelihood functions of, uh, uh, I don't know, for example, uh, the period, the modal period. Uh, we can have this uh, uh, distribution of the damage parameter uh, in a reference configuration where the distribution uh, the, is, is due to, um, well, the variability is due, for example, to environmental sources. Uh, and this is the same distribution uh, for the damaged uh, configuration. So there is an increase 
of the period due to damage uh, and uh, a variation of the distribution, <coughs> or a variation of the variability of the, the parameter. Uh, from these curves, we can uh, estimate the, the probability of not uh, detection, that is the probability that damage is not detected, uh, and this is true, uh, damage does not exist which is the white area here. Uh, or, for example, the probability of false alarm, which is the area here under the curve in the undamaged configuration. And uh, uh, for me? All together. <laughs> okay. So I will, uh, okay, but we have already defined all this. These are all the conditional probability I, I just mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, no, an important thing. In order to define all these probabilities, we need a threshold uh, which uh, um, allows to say if the, the, the damage parameter is beyond the threshold, I will say that the structure is damaged. Otherwise, I will say that the structure is not damaged. How to fix the threshold? The threshold can be fixed, for example, this is a, a proposal, of course, um, saying that the, <clears throat> there is an equal cost of the maximum consequences of the, the probability of false alarm and of missing alarm. And uh, once the threshold is uh, fixed, all the con conditional probability, as just mentioned, can be estimated and uh, used to, to calculate the probability of detection or of not detection. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'll quickly rush to my part. Well, um, as I see the problem of post surgical safety and damage assessment of structures as follows. Basically, before the event, we have an undamaged structure with pre-event characteristics. Then the earthquake event strikes the building, and then it sustains its post-event characteristics. Some of those characteristics can be identified, like stiffness and damping. Some of them cannot be identified, but can only be estimated, like strength and ultimate limit state. Then the responsibility of the engineer that assess the safety of the building is to to estimate what will be the future earthquake shaking that may excite a building at its site, and what will be the post-earthquake state of that building after the earthquake, and then make a decision on the post-earthquake functionality of the structure. Well, in an ideal world, we would have a wonderful model that would capture the response of the structure to that excitation, and that model would provide us the actual damage distribution in our analytical framework. However, where uh, in, in order to achieve that, we would need two critical components. One component would be a numerical model, an analytical model, to simulate the dynamic response and the displacements sustained under that excitation. And the other model would be a perfect estimate of the likely limit states of the structural components, what would be uh, the uh, limit states that correspond to different deformation levels. Those limit states, for example, for a case of an RC member, would be cover concrete spalling, concrete cracking, and reinforcement buckling. These would be the limit states that would trigger some action by the owner of the building or the, the engineer responsible for the safety assessment. In these plots, I'm showing these limit states as a vertical lines at some deterministic points, but actually they're usually not like that, unless we test the structure in a laboratory, we can only estimate those limit states probabilistically for our structure. And also, we, in our non-ideal world, cannot determine a single unique perfect model for our building, but we can generate a set of plausible models that have equal likelihood of representing the response of the building. Then, the key challenge is to identify among those set of plausible models and among those like the range of the limit states, what is the uh, optimal model that represents the behavior of our building. As I see the value of uh, help, uh, information received from health monitoring and inspection data is to identify posterior likelihoods of uh, for different models, starting from a uniform likelihood distribution provided for all models, evaluating the posterior likelihoods for all the models, by taking into account the monitoring data and inspection data, and carrying out a post earthquake risk and safety assessment using the set of best performing models based on this posterior likelihood evaluation. A, a thing I would like to emphasize is to uh, take into account the fact that inspection data would provide an element by element basis severity of the damage, and more importantly, it will also provide some information about the damage mechanism, because we have been talking about the severity of the damage quite a lot, but actually the, flex, uh, the damage mechanism being flexural shear or axial 
also provides quite important information. The same period elongation that is sustained under flexural deformation may be much less critical than the same period elongation that is sustained under flexural damage mechanism, and this has to be taken into account. And I think the taking into account inspection data jointly with monitoring data would enable the uh, engineer to achieve that task. And I would like to pass the floor to Pietro. <laughs> I will quickly write it up. Haider asked yesterday whether we should model consequences uh, of failure. Yes, we should. I was supposed to have two slides, but I will just mention that uh, yes, we should. Uh, and there are considerable um, uncertainties there. Right? So we, we look at consequences, their types, and so on. Um, uh, came up with a few models uh, we used, uh, again, from the robustness uh, cost action previously, and uh, that's from a paper that Marius co-authored and so on. So those cost uh, model for a uh, number of casualties in a building and so on. There are other types of uh, costs you will have to uh, include too. So those cost actions actually appears that they do produce something uh, useful if not being perhaps a little bit self-referential at this point, right? But yes. Um, and conclusions, well, I, I think we, we, we proposed, uh, um, there are many, we proposed a post, uh, pre-posterior uh, decision-making framework for uh, trying to quantify the value for structural health monitoring. Perhaps the, I will jump to the last uh, point here, preempting uh, Sebastian's maybe question, uh, what are we going to do with that? Uh, as a theoretical very kind of uh, attempt at this point, we, we need to pull together and fill all those theoretical concepts with uh, some real data, real example, and so on. Perhaps starting with something that Daniel showed for uh, yesterday for his uh, bridge at uh, Princeton University. But I think uh, as time progresses, we, uh, we can do better than, uh, than uh, such simple examples, doing some more advanced analysis and so on. So yes, with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.